I would like to bring up our next two speakers. Um, our first is Chelsea Bowler. She's a PhD candidate and senior specialist on the restoration and regeneration team with WWF Canada, based in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. Her academic and professional background has spanned many areas of focus, including fisheries, restorations, and resource management, specifically those associated with local Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. We also have Steph Nickel, a uh, who is a graduate of the Beaver Institute's Beaver Corps program. Steph is an associate spe specialist in conservation operations with WWF Canada in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. She works on implementing fish-friendly flow devices as beaver dam res resolutions for salmon and other migratory fish species. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as was mentioned, Steph and I are from Newfoundland and Labrador, and a lot of the work we do engages so many diverse Indigenous communities and governments, and so I just wanted to take a really quick second to do a land acknowledgement. So we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we work and live as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has now been erased forever. We also acknowledge the island of Newfoundland as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and Labrador as the traditional and ancestral home, homelands of the Innu of Natasinan and Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut. We recognize all first peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now and the seven generations to come. We strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. And so the work, thank you. And so the work that, that uh, Steph and I do uh, with this project and also with other projects, we do work really closely with both, with Nuna Tuovet, my PhD work is really closely related to Nunatsiavet, and we also work with uh, many different Mi'kmaq bands around the island of Newfoundland. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we are talking about fish-friendly flow devices that were adapted um, for the purposes of our work that we'll get into more detail about. And this is really, uh, was practice and practice and practice and make lots of mistakes until we figure out what works and we still haven't totally figured out what works. Um, so this has been a really long learning process for us. Um, these devices were the first flow devices of any kind that were really used in the province. Um, and so we had loads of partners that were helping us um, install the devices, give feedback on the devices. We look, worked very closely with the Beaver Institute. Uh, and as mentioned, Steph had that training. So she was also able to help us a lot in the field with making some judgment calls depending on the environment that we were working in. So a little bit about WWF Canada. I'm not going to read out this slide. This is basically our mission statement, but um, things have shifted for WWF Canada in the last couple of years as we've had a new strategic plan. So we used to work, um, we used to work a lot on like fisheries projects, um, we used to do work on climate change as well, but now really climate change, carbon sequestration, big restoration activities, these are now the focus for our organization. Um, and really our long-term vision is, is to have a world where nature and people strive together. And so we do work with industry, we do work with communities. Um, a lot of people have the, the misunderstanding that we're an animal rights organization, which we're not. We work very closely with um, Indigenous communities and other, other folks who um, you know, hunt and have subsistence livelihoods as well. Okay, so I think that um, the work that we've done stands out a little bit differently than some of the other presentations we've seen today, um, because our project really started first around salmon and fish and less so about beavers and beavers just kind of came about. Steph was at this conference a couple of years ago, and I think fell in, in love with beavers and I've since become a beaver believer since being on this project for the last year or so. Um, so just a little bit about the funding that we received and kind of our focus for this work. So we, um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada is our federal fisheries department. And most, a lot of our funding comes from federal and provincial funds. And so the Coastal Restoration Fund was a five-year fund that we focused primarily on salmon, char, and capelin. 
And so some of the other work that we did around this fund is we had a restoration for Cape Lynn, um, and we're on the East Coast, and so I recognize a lot of you are on the West Coast maybe don't know what Cape Lynn are, but they're a very small forage fish that help support the North Atlantic ecosystem, and they spawn actually by like rolling up on beaches across Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and so we had some um, restoration at a beach site and some monitoring there. Um, we also supported restoration priorities in Nunatuavut, which is in Southern Labrador. And we also had uh, Parker's River Restoration, which is the southernmost um, anadromous population of Arctic char, as well as Atlantic salmon. And they were having a lot of die-offs in that region. So we um, restored that site um, over the five years with loads of input from many different partners. And then we had our fish-friendly flow device project, pilot project for the region. And so we have adapted the Snomish Pond Leveler for our fish-friendly flow device. Um, and as we get more into the details about what worked and what didn't work, I wish so badly that we knew about the design that Alyssa had presented yesterday, because I'm like, man, that would have worked so well. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm just really excited to see all the different adaptations that everybody has been doing in different regions all over North America and, uh, and in Europe. Um, and so the biggest thing um, for Newfoundland and Labrador is uh, in terms of salmon and beaver interactions, we're a small province in terms of population. Um, I have no idea how big St. John's is, but the second largest city is Corner Brook, around 30,000 people. I live in a community of like 200 people. Um, so a lot of the work that happens that we do both in Newfoundland and Labrador isn't in these really highly urbanized areas. Like we've seen a lot of examples over the last um, couple of days. And uh, we have lots of anglers on the rivers, so lots of folks who fish for salmon. And really these devices were, uh, were implemented as mitigation measures to perceived barriers. So we've heard lots of really cool stories from people who have witnessed really cool things in the field where they see salmon literally swimming through a dam in the little kind of uh, cracks and crevices in the dam, salmon bashing their heads against the dam to get through, salmon jumping over these really large structures that we might think otherwise that they wouldn't be able to pass. Um, and so this is definitely um, this is definitely an issue in terms of anglers not understanding one what salmon adult salmon are actually capable of doing and how they can get over these structures and two not understanding the importance of that habitat that these dams create that we've learned so much about over the last couple of days as well if you have attended any of the fish um, salmon talks um, and so the way that uh, things work in Newfoundland and Labrador too that I'll get a little bit more into is that it doesn't matter where these river systems are, even if it goes through private property, private homeowners don't have any jurisdiction over waterways. Um, so all of the regulation comes from federal and provincial agencies. And so, um, so DFO is the F Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and they, and then we have the Wildlife Department with the province, um, and we have a fur, fur bear biologist that works um, on beaver stuff. So th they actually give out permits to tear out beaver dams, which I think is so strange, <laughs> so strange, because especially from a fisheries perspective, if you're thinking about the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So it's actually totally legal and um, I don't want to say encouraged, but definitely supported that as long as you call and let DFO know what you're doing and you get a permit, you're allowed to rip out beaver dams. Um, and it doesn't really matter the reason if you're if it's flooding or you're concerned about salmon, it's just like if you want to rip that out, you can. Um, I've also learned a lot more about the hunting and hunting and trapping that happens around Newfoundland and Labrador, um, specifically with beaver, because I wasn't familiar with it. So um, the other thing that might be different than some other regions is um, there's designated trap lines that are set up in the in the region. Um, and one person has control over that trap line, but there's actually a minimum requirement for a number of beavers trapped. You have to at least trap five beavers a season, yes. And if you don't, um, you have the risk of losing that trap line and it being uh, given to someone else or sold to somebody else through the provincial wildlife system. Um, and they do encourage folks to remove beavers from, they, they encourage trappers to remove beavers from um, areas where they're getting complaints about flooding or other things that folks might be concerned about. Um, so there's really just this big kind of like the, the way the regulations are stated and even just general, um, like the hunter and trapper guide, general information in there typically has been focused on removing beavers and removing them from problem areas um, without much of a consideration for um, the impacts that that has on ecosystems or specific species, especially Atlantic salmon that are endangered in the region. 
Um, so that all that being said, one of the highlights of the work, um, Victoria Neville used to be in the role that I'm currently in, and she was here a couple of years ago, you may have heard her speak. But one of the big wins for her was a couple of years ago, having a, kind of like a blurb of information on the importance of beaver habitat and how it supports salmon populations actually in the angler guide. So even though we still have this information on trapping and trying to remove beavers, there's also starting to be the shift in culture around how we understand beaver habitat and how it affects other species in the province that folks may be concerned about. Okay, so the locations. So this is Newfoundland and Labrador. So it is one province, but disconnected by a channel of water in the North Atlantic. Um, so we, uh, Steph and I both live in Newfoundland, which is the island portion of the province. I think there's a pointer on here. Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you still hear me? Perfect. Okay, so I live in this area over here. Steph lives all the way over here, about seven hours away. So a lot of our, um, these two guys here were pretty close to, um, to St. John's area, which is near where Steph lives. Uh, and so they were easily monitored. And then we have Windmill Bite up here that's in a small community. And then we have Shinnies Brook up in Newfoundland, or up in Labrador rather, on the mainland portion of the province. Um, and just some things that I wanted to mention. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Newfoundland, but we're called the rock. We're literally a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic. Um, and so something that um, differs from a lot of the examples that I've seen over the last couple of days is the ability to actually secure these devices. Um, so it's bedrock in a lot of the river systems that we work in. Uh, it's not mud, it's not sand. It's really hard to drive rebar or stakes or anything else down into the river system to be able to secure it. Um, we also, as I mentioned, lived in a small province in terms of population. And although the Arnold's Cove and Avondale sites are fairly accessible, other, the other two sites and other test sites we had in earlier years of this pilot project are really remote and difficult to get to. So I'm, Steph is going to get more into the designs of the actual equipment that we used. But as you could see um, in some of the, the photo that I had on the last slide here, like we have a lot of lumber that we used and these big tubes and these really heavy pieces of material. And I'm just like, why didn't we think of downgrading some of this and using some lighter materials? Um, because we weren't able to stake down a lot of the equipment, um, some, some ideas around stabilizing these devices included like cinder blocks. In one of the locations that was more isolated, we like threw rocks inside the actual cage to try and keep the cage supported because we couldn't um, drive those stakes down deep enough into the riverbed. Um, and yeah, and I guess I had already kind of mentioned a little bit about the jurisdiction thing, but I just want to emphasize that all of the work that happens around beaver bafflers, pond levelers, whatever the, however you would like to call it, has nothing to do with landowners at all. So it's really... Um, in terms of uh, getting their permission to do something, we certainly work with community members, um, folks that are salmon advocates. We work with different salmon groups. Um, we also hired a contractor to do the actual physical installations. And Steph and I were on site helping, especially with Steph's expertise, doing the, the Beaver Institute's course and having that knowledge behind her. Um, but in terms of actually like getting permission to do something, that comes solely from the, the Provincial Department of Wildlife and then also the fisheries, uh, the federal fisheries department. I'm going to pass it over to Steph now. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I hope you can hear me okay. Good? Okay. Perfect. Um, so here is a couple of examples of the installations that we did in the Wimble Bite location, which was pretty far in up, up river. So we had about a 40 minute walk through the river um, with all of our materials <laughs> in 40 degree heat, 40 degrees Celsius uh, heat. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the, 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 the trek in, I should say. So it's, uh, it would have been great, as Chelsea mentioned, if we uh, had maybe you know, adapted a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so with this uh, version here, we actually put a cap on, uh, we modified this and we put a cap on the end of the pipe. So it had the same size hole as the other version that you had seen previously, which had the box at the end. So we removed the box and we just put a cap with the, the hole where the salmon could go through um, in this area right here. And then here I am installing the, um, the 
camera so that we could view and, and see if uh, and monitor because we wouldn't be in this area very often. Uh, so we needed to record um, if the salmon was going through uh, the, the device. Yeah. So this is the Arnold's Cove uh, installation. This was actually a fantastic installation. Nothing moved, nothing shifted. Every time we went back, it was great. It was still in place. Um, and this is, so this was um, in the fall. And this is more in the summertime, and you can see the the difference in the uh, in the height of the water. Um, and we also installed signage and in all of our installation sites um, as an education piece, so people could actually uh, contact us. We had our contact information there. It explained a bit about what we were doing, why the devices were installed, um, just to give people uh, more of a concept idea of. Um, of what these devices were for and not to remove them. And we worked with uh, a lot of communities on these things as well. So we would contact the communities, let them know that, uh, like the um, municipalities, to let them know that we were doing these installs and to get their opinions and um, just to give them a bit of background information on what it's for. Um, so, yeah, device. Okay, so I just I basically said this previously, but the box was replaced with the pipe cap for the uh, the installation in Windmill White, and location accessibility. Yeah, it was it was hard uh, tracking all this stuff in, um, and we had a staff capacity issue as well. So when we go on site, we had our contractor was there, as Chelsea mentioned. But we also uh, had some volunteers that would come out to help us um, slug in all the equipment. Um, if if these areas were off, like off um, off the highway, <laughs> sorry, a couple of the places the installs were right off the road, so it was easier just to pull up and offload the uh, the equipment. Not a problem. But this this one was further in. And here's some uh, fantastic shots of fish actually using the devices. So this one right here is Shinny's Brook. This is the Labrador site. Um, and then we, the, these are adult salmon. And then we had the juvenile salmon who went through the Arnold's Cove one. And that was the one that I had mentioned hadn't shifted or moved or anything, stayed in place. So here's a bit of a disaster. So this is the Aventail location. And as Chelsea mentioned, we had a bit of an issue stabilizing the, um, the flow devices. So they didn't shift or move. Uh, even using center blocks and uh, trying, to, um, trying to stabilize them as best as possible. Uh, ice is a big factor. In Newfoundland, we could have four seasons in one day. It's uh, pretty blustery, it's really windy. We could have 120 kilometer winds and that's just like a regular day. Um, so when the ice builds up over the winter, it creates havoc. So it actually destroyed the cage uh, and shifted it. So this sea monster over here is the cage has actually moved from all the way over here and is now on top of the beaver dam. So, and the box, which was in this location disappeared. <laughs> we don't even know what happened to it. It just left. Um, and the beaver obviously was able to get in because the ice destroyed the cage and they blocked it up. And so lessons learned here, we need to find a new way of stabilizing the equipment. Um, so rebar, like the cross bracing on the pipe, uh, if we could find a way to actually get the rebar into the, the bedrock, then that would be great. Yeah, and we couldn't even go out and adjust these. So this is the windmill bite one. This one actually shifted as well and just kind of coiled around itself. It was really hard to keep them in place with the ice and we weren't able to go out and make any modifications because of safety concerns. Myself and Chelsea actually took a course in swift water um, rescue just in case we were on a river and the beaver dam 
washed out and we were in a log jam and couldn't get out of it, we went ahead and took the, the training course for Swift Water Rescue. And so just summary results. So the Arnold's Cove, there was no dam breach. Everything was great. No device washout and juvenile uh, fish passed through. The Avondale, we had a dam breach. The device did wash out. There were no fish, pa fish, fish passage noted uh, for that one. Shinny's Brook, the there was a dam breach but the and the device washed out, but we did capture adult salmon swimming through the device. And windmill bite, we did have a dam breach. The devices did wash out, so there were two in that location. Um, and we didn't notice any fish passage through those, unfortunately. So did you want me to go through? Or you want to? Doesn't matter, yeah. Um, yeah, and one thing I just wanted to mention um, before we get into the partners and thank yous is, um, as I mentioned, this project really started out as a fish project, um, but the more and more we learned about beaver habitat, not just from a perspective of supporting Atlantic salmon, um, but from a perspective of climate resilience and carbon sequestration, that has kind of been more of the focus um, in the last few months, I would say, as we're kind of sunsetting this project is really uh, to better understand all of those other implications that beavers have on our landscape and in wetland areas, um, as it is a new focus for, for WWF Canada. And so I was, um, like I said, I, I didn't know much about beavers, and now I'm definitely a believer and fighting to continue some of this beaver work for our organization, because I think it obviously um, applies really greatly to the key concerns we have as an organization across Canada, and especially for Newfoundland and Labrador. And as both Steph and I mentioned, many of our wonderful partners, we partnered with the provincial and federal governments, but also some amazing community groups um, and in Indigenous uh, governments as well. So we had uh, SPAWN and um, an ASF, the Atlantic Salmon Foundation. Those are two local uh, I guess, salmon activist groups in the region. And then Nunatuvit, which is our Southern Inuit group, uh, Indian Bay Ecosystem Corporation, which wasn't actually an initial partner um, on, at the very beginning of this project, um, but they kind of came on partway through because the site that we had was really isolated at Windmill Bite, but it was actually one of the regular kind of patrol areas that they took on. So they um, were amazing and sent us so much information when Steph and I weren't able to get out to the, to the site ourselves. And then Wood was our wonderful contractor who did all of the analysis and monitoring, the camera monitoring and reporting for us. And then, of course, the Beaver Institute that, that uh, provided training, but also amazing support throughout the duration of our project, um, giving us feedback and different ideas and connecting, up, connecting us with other experts in the field. So thank you so much for your attention. I know it's been a long couple of days, but uh, Steph and I, I think we have some time for some questions. We'd be happy to take some questions if anyone has them. Thank you so much. Hey there, great talk. Um, so I've visited a couple sites where they had catastrophic dam blowouts and the prevailing theory at those sites was that the dams somehow got eaten away by erosion or something from underneath and they basically floated up and then exploded out. Uh, do you see, because you have just hard substrate that's difficult to anchor to, do you see maybe an increase in prevalence of dam blowouts and how are those dams staying in place when all that craziness is going on? <laughs> it is craziness. That's a really good thought actually. And um, I had a similar question for a presenter yesterday and she said, you know, in some areas, these blowouts are just, you know, they're natural and, and it's okay that you might have some seasons where salmon get caught or where there's lots of water exchange when that dam blows out. Um, so I, I would, I mean, I think it's a good assumption to say that probably that that substrate has something to do with it. Um, I think it also matters how much woody debris and ice is in the particular stream, because in some streams that are flashy, um, for example, the Av Avondale location, yeah, the Avondale location, um, the, we did have loads of water and we did have our device wash out, but the dam was actually fairly intact. There was like a little kind of breach or a notch that happened on one side, but the rest of the dam was pretty well intact. Whereas in windmill bite, for example, like the whole dam just let go. So I think it probably has to do with the type of substrate that's found in the river system, how active the beavers have been and how long they've been in the area, because we've only had these devices installed for the last couple of seasons. So we don't necessarily have a lot of historical information on how long they've been in the region. Um, 
And yeah, and then we've just had crazy weather because of climate change. So we've had lots of rain in the winter, which we don't normally get. We've had um, just a lot of like freeze and thaw cycles. So just the rivers have been doing some crazy things. And like has been mentioned in many of the um, presentations, we're seeing um, storms and water flow on like a 20 year time scale that we're seeing like every other year. And so the climate I think definitely has something to do with it. So maybe, you know, in decades previous, these dams might've stayed intact, but now they're being washed out on a more regular basis.